Mary Met, virtual traveller, and welcome to Stories from Law, a podcast that invites you to rewild yourself through story by exploring nature, folklore, and the stories it inspires. My name is Dawn Nelson, and I'm an author and professional storyteller. The theme for this episode is Persephone's Pomegranate, and in it we're exploring the folklore, nature, and stories of the underworlds. No, I don't mean that famous underwear factory on Coronation Street. I mean the actual underworlds. For the story trail section of the podcast, we're off to my local graveyard on a dark evening to ponder where we may dwell once we are no longer of this earth. Walking up through my local graveyard, and it's about eight o'clock in the evening. Or coming up to it's taking a path which I take every day to take my daughter to school. But even with the house lights around it and the floodlights for the car park, it's still a very, very different place. We have a lot of owls in the village, particularly tawny owls. And they are talking to each other. So as I'm walking through, I see all the headstones which stand almost as tall as me because I'm not the tallest person in the world. Some of them are more ornate than others. Depends how long they've been here. This is a very old graveyard. There's definitely bats that come across here as well at the right time of day. And it's here that most of the people in this village have come to rest once they have passed on. The floodlights have just gone out on the car park and now it's very dark. This um, graveyard is a pretty peaceful graveyard actually. When the school runs it's alive with the children's voices. It's got the standard constituents of a graveyard. The yew trees, the church, so like I say it's a pretty old church. It's got the path that weaves through the graves if you walk through in a particular way. Oh and at the moment I can just catch in the light of my torch some beautiful little tiny white snowdrops just starring part of the grass. It's lovely. There's those owls again out in the distance. As I move along the shadows from all the crosses move as well. It's like having a cavalcade of crosses following me along. So this is where we all come to rest. Some of them have been here hundreds of years, some of them not so long. Some lovely little epitaphs as well. Things like, Bubble, always loved. Quite a few graves underneath this yew here. Actually, that's a cedar. 
very difficult to tell in the dark sometimes. It's a wonderfully big cedar reaching out its arms, keeping watch over the graves. The church wardens are pretty good and they keep these graves in very good nick, given that some of these may not even have people still around in the village to look after them. There's some benches every now and then, so you can sit and spend some time with the graves. A lot of these are overgrown in this part of the graveyard that I've walked into. There's a little stone angel in the middle of that one. This one's got the whole family the family grave. This one's covered in yellow lichen, but you can just about see that it's from the 1940s. It's just a very peaceful place. I hope I'm not disturbing them too much. This one's rather magnificent. It's got a long stone edge to it, almost like a bed. And then a stone, grey stone at the top, like a bed head. That's from 1914, that one. At least I think it is from what I can work out beneath the lichen. The yew in this graveyard stands uh, very close to the front of the church. Um, it's thought to be a good few hundred years old. And it's a uh, arborous arms cover many of the graves, some of which have had to be lain down underneath it. Definitely as an air of protection and of guardianship. I'm not a religious person myself. Most definitely secular and spiritual, but I'm not religious, certainly not Christian, but I appreciate the part they play in the village and being the center of village life. And I think a graveyard it's definitely a symbol of that, of all these people's lives and all this community all together, resting in peace. In story, underworlds are dark, dank places. Places long cut off from the light afforded the upper world. Places, we are told, where nothing good will occur. Social constructs reinforce this. The need to continue being productive, continue with the routine and fill the space with neon lights to convince ourselves we do not need the dark of the underworld. But that is not so. Darkness is a very necessary place. And if we play by the rules of the darkness and we do not lose ourselves to these spaces, well, then the underworlds can offer us a sanctuary. What are those rules? Well, in short, they are be sure of yourself and do not look back. Behave with reverence within the liminal space and only take what you need. And if you do these things, well, then you will emerge from the underworld wiser and stronger. In many mythic underworlds, it is not just souls that must pass through them, but the sun too, on its daily journey through the sky. This is the case, for example, with the Egyptian god Ra and his sunboat, and it's also the case in many of the Scandinavian mythologies, as the sun is seen to disappear below the horizon, and therefore beneath the earth, and reappear by rising out of the earth. 
If it is your soul that is on its way to the underworld, well, then there are many psychopomps and ferrymen of sorts that will accompany you. And I discuss many of these in Season 2, Episode 2, The Dead Do Tell Tales. Once you are there, though, there is usually someone in charge. In Celtic mythology, Arwen rules the underworld, which is interchangeably called the Otherworld. In Norse, it is Hel, the half-alive, half-dead daughter of Loki. And in Greek mythology, it is Hades, the dark brother of Zeus. Although it could be argued that neither of these brothers deport themselves well in many of the myths presented to us in the Pantheon. Mythologies across the globe have their underworlds. Hindus, Yamaloka. In Japan, Yomi. In Buddhism and Taoism, there is a purgatory named Diu. And for the Maori people of New Zealand, Raraheng. But for this episode, it is the Celtic, by which I mean Irish, Welsh and Cornish mythology, Scandinavian and Greek mythologies that I shall concentrate on. In these underworlds, dogs also play a big part. Arwen has a pack of dogs that frequently ride through the sky. Cerberus is a fearsome, many-headed dog that belongs to Hades and guards the Greek underworld. And even Hell has a wolf dog named Gama, the original hellhound. Ancient cults within Greece and Rome used the underworld mythologies to base many of their rituals on, and their initiations often involved travelling through caves or dark places to emerge as a member of the cult. So let's take a closer look at the stories associated with these mythologies and their underworld. In Celtic mythology, underworlds and otherworlds seem to be used interchangeably, as if the listener of the story simply knew which the teller or chronicler was referring to. Otherworlds, though, tend to be associated with fairies and underworlds the dead, but both of these liminal spaces you can enter and return from, as long as you follow the rules. The most important one of all is respect. Do not respect the place you are in, or the folk who live there, and you are unlikely to return. The berry-bearing yew tree has a very close connection with Celtic mythology and the underworld. This is through its association with death. Yew trees are often found in graveyards, and there are several reasons why they may be there. The most popular is that they are sacred trees associated with death and rebirth, perhaps because it was observed that if a yew tree dropped a branch, new roots would shoot from it. As they are in graveyards, the roots of the trees also grow through graves and become entwined with those interred below, and this would have been noted when new graves were dug. Because the yew tree was often a community meeting place, some argue that the yew tree was there first, and then the church was built beside it so that the heathens would then come to church and be reformed. Another theory, which was shared with me recently by a friend who works in building restoration, is that community rubbish tips were often near the church, and therefore graveyard. This was so that the villagers, on their way to church, would place their old bottles, pots and crockery in the pits until it was full up. Once it was covered over, a tree would be planted on the top, often a yew tree, in order to stop the cattle from digging up the graves in the graveyard. Why yew? Well, the yew berries are poisonous to cattle, and to us, just as an aside, and so they would naturally stay away from the tree, protecting the graves, and in turn, the cattle from digging up any old crockery which may harm them. During my research for this episode, I came across a little story about Bodmin Moor and a place called Dosmery Pool. Dosmery Pool is considered to be one of the doorways to the Celtic underworld. Dosmery Pool is reported to be bottomless, although you may be able to access it via a series of tunnels from Fernie Harbour. But from what I can see, that's a good 20 miles away, so I'm not sure how true this is. The story centres around a man named Tregeagle, and there are various different versions of this story. Tregeagle lived by the lake. He was a greedy soul, and one day he spoke out loud that he wished to own everything that he could see. As often occurs in these tales, a shadowy figure appears and offers to grant him this wish, but only for 100 years, whereupon the figure will then return for Tregeagle's soul. Does that sound familiar? Well, arrogant as he is, Tregeagle accepts the deal and falls instantly into a stupor. He awakes to find himself dressed in fine clothes, in a castle with servants and land as far as the eye can see. Or at least his eye, as per the bargain. One day, there is a violent storm, and he finds a woman who has become lost, separated from her hunting party, alone and vulnerable. Being the chivalrous man that he is, he takes her in and insists that she become his wife, whether she like it or not. Unsurprisingly, the woman's father, who is Lord Loriston, notices she is missing, and he goes looking for her. He finds the page boy that accompanied the hunt, and the page tells the lord what has happened. Lord Loriston arrives at the castle to demand his daughter is returned to him, 
and it looks like there is going to be a mighty battle when conveniently Tregeagle's 100 years are finally up. The daughter is freed, the castle disappears, and in its place the pool appears. A portal to the underworld, perhaps. King Arthur is a legendary figure which many will be familiar with and whom has many, many adventures in and fleeting glimpses of the underworld. One of the most well-known stories in Arthurian legends that involves the underworld is the story of Killock and Olwen. Killock is a cursed prince who convinces Arthur to accompany him to the underworld and retrieve a cauldron that will only boil meat if it is intended to be eaten by a brave man. But let's save that story for another day. For now, let's take a look at Scandinavian underworlds. These are perhaps a little more clear-cut, although not always. There are two places in the Norse mythology that the dead can go. To Niflheim, where Helheim is and where they will reside with Hel, or Valhalla, a giant mead hall. It is said that Hel's domain is for those who have not died with honour in battle. It's a place of sorrow and wandering souls. Hel is a bitter goddess who often appears surly and vengeful. This is in part thanks to Snorri Sturluson's descriptions of Hel in the Poetic Eda, which are extremely bleak. But this isn't so in all records of myth. In most of them, Hell is a fairly neutral place. It would be where we all went if we weren't warriors. So you could have led a perfectly good life, uh, feeding the village with food or telling them stories, and you would end up in hell. It's just where you went. Perhaps it is just our modern associations with the Christian hell with a double L that have led to Norse hells with one L in Helheim to have a worse reputation than it actually does. In fact, the goddess Hel is quite happy to answer your questions if you follow the road to Helheim, and she can be quite a straightforward, reasonable goddess, unlike the devil of the Christian mythology. Valhalla, on the other hand, is a place of joyous, raucous feasting, where those who have died with honour, i.e. with their weapon in their hand on the battlefield, that's where they will go. But it's not all good, for they are waiting until they are needed again to fight in the last battle, Ragnarok, the day to end all days, and that is when they will be resurrected. Again, however, Snorri is the only one to have made this distinction, and this delineation is much less straightforward when the stories were originally told. So that, in a nutshell, is the Norse mythology. What about the Greek mythology? Well, we're all fairly familiar with the underworld and Hades. And within Greek mythology, the pomegranate, that famous pomegranate that Persephone was forced to eat, is known as the fruit of the dead, not only because of its associations with that story, but also because of its role in the story of Adonis. Adonis was Aphrodite's lover, and when he was tragically gored to death by a boar whilst out hunting, Aphrodite's tears mixed with his blood, and where they fell, the pomegranate grew. Persephone's story is an interesting one. It's a very violent story. It's a story of her uncle abducting her, taking her against her will to live in the underworld with her, a place where Persephone does not belong. She's a goddess that when she moves across the earth with her bare feet, flowers spring from the earth. She doesn't belong in a dank, dark place like the underworld. She is not only taken against her will, but when the gods finally tell Hades that he must release her, Hades forces her to eat six pomegranate seeds, or in some versions just three, so that she has to stay with him for a certain portion of the year. His rule is that anybody who eats the food of the underworld has to stay there. As well as Persephone's story, which I will be sharing my telling of in a moment, another well-known myth emerging from the Greek underworld is that of Orpheus and Eurydice. Orpheus is famous for his music and lyre, a gift from the god that when played will make all things in the world stand still and listen. When his wife, Eurydice, dies tragically, he grieves, and the world grieves with him. He is eventually allowed to retrieve Eurydice from Hades' realm, provided he follows a set of rules as he is leading her soul out of the darkness. One of these rules is that he must not look back. And, spoiler alert, listener, he, of course, cannot resist looking back, and Eurydice is lost forever. This has many similarities with the Persephone and Hades myth, Demeter and Orpheus's grief and rage at the loss that they have suffered is probably the things that make these stories stick out for us because Zeus is forced to do something about it and Zeus does not normally do anything he doesn't want to. 
In Greek myth and indeed other mythologies, very few escape the underworld entirely. Once you have travelled there, it leaves its mark in one way or another, and none more so than the story of Persephone. And it is Persephone's story that I wish to tell you next. This recording is taken from a live show I performed back in September 23. It was an online show that was a collaboration with Jason Buck. To find out more about where I'm performing live next, either online or in person, you can visit the events page on my website via the links in the episode notes. For now, travel with me to a beautiful meadow in Greece. This story starts in a time when the word harvest, well, it, it wasn't really used because it wasn't really necessary. You could just pick anything you liked at any time of year. And the goddess Demeter, who we now know as the goddess of the harvest, she was the one that was responsible for that. There wasn't a time when you went out and picked particular fruits. They were just there. You didn't need to wait to spring for asparagus. You didn't need to wait until the summer for the strawberries, and you certainly didn't need to wait to the autumn if you wanted to carve a pumpkin. Demeter would just provide plenty for everyone, especially wheat and rye and barley in the fields. There was plenty of that to go round. It was a time of abundance, and the people knew it, and they gave uh, praise to Demeter. They would build um, uh, chapels to her and temples and they would build around the the bottom of the temples they would create um like a a ditch around the side of it like a channel where they would pour the corn and the oil and they would give praise to her give thanks for all the um the the good food that she had brought them now Demeter she was very proud and she was one of the original gods of uh, Olympus now she had a daughter. Her daughter was Persephone. She was very, very proud of this daughter as well, as you might expect, because Persephone was beautiful. She was far more beautiful than any of the other goddesses. And Demeter knew it, although she would not ever have said it, because we know what happens when that is said out loud. Hera doesn't like it. But she did guard her daughter zealously. She didn't think that anybody was good enough to marry Persephone. Apollo came to ask, but no, his music and his skill at hunting, they were not good enough. Hermes came to ask, but his flying sandals and his knowledge of all things and his ability to have all the gossip in the whole of Olympus, oh no, no, that was not good enough either. She had many, many suitors. None of them, none of them pass Demeter's muster. Now, there was one who had not yet set eyes on Persephone. That was the god Hades. Now, many of you may know that Hades' domain is the underworld. Zeus is the overworld, let's call it that. They were brothers. Hades had been sent to the underworld many, many moons ago, and all he really had for company were the moaning spirits that appeared to be trapped within the underworld and a multi-headed slavering dog. He wasn't all that pleased about it, to be honest, but he made the most of things, you know, he got on okay with Charon and, you know, the rivers, you know, it was quite nice to sit by the river occasionally. The dog could be some company occasionally, but he longed for somebody to share that realm with him. Nobody was ever going to want to marry Hades, though. Who would want to spend the rest of their life in the underworld? Nobody would want to do that. And occasionally, Hades would come up to the surface to survey the overworld and try to convince himself that he was better off down in the underworld. And on this occasion, he'd taken his chariot out and he was doing just that. When he saw Persephone, she was out in the fields gathering beautiful flowers. 
harebells, forget-me-nots, translucent red poppies. She was completely oblivious to anything else around her. And when he set eyes on her, he knew that this woman had to be queen of his underworld. He also knew that she was unlikely to agree to this. And he could see a likeness of her that was a little like Demeter. And he'd heard that Demeter was no way going to allow him to marry Persephone. He realized this must be her daughter. And so he made that judgment at that point in time that he would just take her, whether she wanted to go or not. And so as his chariot rode past, he scooped her up and he abducted her and took her down to the underworld, hell, Hades, whatever it is, you know it as. Persephone screamed, a scream that would normally have wrenched the world in two if it had not already been as Hades was disappearing down into the underworld. There were some who heard it, some who even saw it, but nobody said anything. Nobody was going to cross Hades. When Persephone landed in the underworld and was told by Hades of her fate, that she would be down there forever now, his bride, his queen of the underworld, well, she was not overjoyed. In fact, she cried. She cried and she wailed and she made more noise than those wailing spirits could ever have made. And Hades did wonder for a while there whether it was such a good idea, but he kept his resolve. He thought this girl will be broken. She will stay here as my queen of the underworld. And he brought her rock treasures, gems like rubies and emeralds, but she was not interested and she continued to cry and add to the waters of the rivers in hell. She was not at all interested in the three-headed dog either. She did not think that that was an adequate family pet. No. She even told Hades that there would be people that were looking for her and that there was no way that she would stay down here. He tried to tempt her with beautiful food and all the fruits that she might find up on the surface. But she knew that if she ate any of those fruits, well, she would have to stay there. That was one of the rules of Hades, that if you ate the fruit of that land, you would have to stay there forever. We'll leave Persephone with Hades for now. Because, of course, Demeter is still in the overworld and she is looking for her daughter. She does not know where she has gone. She heard something along with the rest of the world, but she does not know what it was that happened. Her daughter was there one minute and then gone the next. She did not come back from fetching the flowers in the fields. She asks the woodland nymphs and she goes to the meadows to ask the fairies there. She goes and asks the selkies down by the sea. She asks the pegasus and the satyrs and the nymphs. Nobody knows, or at least nobody is willing to say. She travels many miles across the world asking anybody that she comes across what has happened to her beautiful Persephone. As she goes, she cries tears too. And they nourish the land and more harvest springs up where she is. It does nothing to please her. She has no taste for food at all anymore. Eventually, she reaches a town called Eleusinia. And here, the people worship her and they have a temple. And she speaks to the people and she asks them, if they know where Persephone is gone, her most loyal worshippers, do they know where Persephone is gone? And they do not. And so she takes herself into the temple and she locks herself in the temple and she says that she will not come out and she will not create any more abundance and no more harvest, no more prosperity for anybody ever in the world until her daughter is returned to her. Well, the people, they're obviously, do not know what to do. They try all they can to keep as much food for the coming hardship that they know will be 
on its way. They keep as much as they can back, but of course they need to feed themselves. And as the days roll into weeks, roll into months, roll into years, there's no food. They start to complain to their gods. And Zeus hears of this. Zeus calls all the other gods to him. And he says, right, come on, somebody must know. Somebody has got to know what has happened to Persephone. The people down there are starving. They're not going to praise us anymore. We are certainly going to become completely insignificant unless we return Persephone, because Demeter will not come out of that temple until we do. You will tell me, one of you, what has happened to her. Helios, who of course carries the sun across the sky every day, sees everything. And he has seen what has happened to Persephone. And he steps forward and he says, <clears throat> I think I know who's got her, Zeus. And come on then, out with it. I think, I think your brother's got her, Hades. Really? Y yes, he wants her to be the queen of the underworld. What? I, I don't know why she would have a problem with that. Why wouldn't she want to be queen? My brother's queen, I think that's a jolly good idea. Well, <sighs> I don't think Persephone thinks it is. And clearly Demeter doesn't. You're right, said Zeus. Um, and the people don't think it's a good idea either. So, well, Hermes, I guess you're going to have to go and get her. So, Hermes, always the messenger, is sent down to Hades. He doesn't know how he's going to get Hades to give Persephone back, but he's going to give it a go. He enters the realm of the underworld with all the, the spirits and the wailing ghosts and the slavering multi-headed dog. And he approaches the thrones where there is Hades and Persephone, who is still crying and has yet to eat anything from the underworld. I don't know how she's managed all this time other than to say she is part goddess. So, you know. Now, Hades obviously asks what Hermes has come for and Hermes says, look, Zeus has said, you've got to give up Persephone. I don't want to, says Hades. I think she makes a perfectly good queen of the underworld. Why can't she not stay here? She, she'll get used to it eventually. You know, it's only been a couple of years. N uh, no, no, he's, he's quite insistent on this. And, and Demeter, she has locked herself in a temple and she's refusing to come out. And there's not been a harvest in the world for at least two years. And people are starving out there. Hmm. I can see how that would be a problem, says Hades. What do you suggest we do about it? Well, well, I think you're just going to have to do what Zeus has said. Hermes, I don't think there's any way around that. I mean, Persephone hasn't eaten anything down here, has she? N no, says Hades. Well, well, then just return her. She'll be fine. You never know. She might come back. No, I won't, says Persephone. Well, okay says Hades, his mind working overtime. I tell you what, we can't have you going back looking like that, Persephone, because you've been crying for a very long time and, you know, to be reunited with your mother in that state and you haven't had anything to eat and I'm not having anything to eat, Hades, you are not tricking me that way, says Persephone. Well, at least have some water, says Hades. But but I didn't think I could eat or drink in the underworld, said Persephone. Well, actually, says Hermes, drinking's okay. It's, it's just the eating you can't do. Oh, okay. Yes, well, I will have a drink before I go back uh, and we will part as friends. We will part as friends, said Persephone. This is, this is the decent thing to do, I suppose. And so Hades hands Persephone a small amount of mead. Now, within this strong wine, he has placed six pomegranate seeds. Persephone does not know this. And of course, she will not taste it as she drinks. And so as they drink a glass together, she lifts the glass to her lips. She drinks back the wine and swallows the six pomegranate seeds. 
Her eyes widen as she realizes what she's done. You tricked me, Hades. Hermes, he tricked me. I can't stay here. You said I have to go. Zeus won't have it. Hermes looks at Hades and looks at Persephone and he says, no, Zeus will not have it. Well, you better go up back and, and tell him she's eaten something now, says Hades. Hermes, always a messenger, has to go back and tell Zeus. Zeus is livid. And he, when he's had time to think about it, he says, well, actually, it was only six pomegranate seeds that she drank. And she was tricked. So I think that she should be allowed to return to the overworld for six months of the year. And the other six, she should spend with Hades. Hermes goes back, tells Hades of this bargain that has been struck between him and Zeus. Hades agrees. Persephone, she doesn't have any choice about it, but she is pleased to be reunited with her mother. She goes back to the overworld. Her and her mother, they are reunited. Eventually, a harvest does return to the world. And when Persephone has to return to the underworld, well, that is the time that we now have winter. The six months where we do not have as much food as we perhaps did during those plentiful months of spring and summer. And that is how we now have seasons. That is the story of Persephone and Hades. Thank you. Thanks for joining me for this dark, dank and otherworldly episode of Stories from Law. For more folklore and stories, you can subscribe to my Substack. Just hop over to the Substack site and search for Kerridgeman's Cauldron, or use the link in the show notes. You can upgrade to a paid subscriber for just £5 a month. That's less than a pint in your local pub. This gives you an extra dose of wild storytelling every month straight to your inbox. And it helps me to research new stories and bring them to life. Either way, signing up as a paid or free subscriber is much appreciated and helps to support the podcast and my work with Folklore and Story. For this episode, extras will include a closer look at the fruit and food associated with the dead and the underworld, a written version of the folklore included in this podcast, and a link to the Spotify playlist, which includes a variety of underworld-themed music. As well as Substack, you can find me on Instagram as dd underscore storyteller and on Facebook as dd storyteller. Reviews are always gratefully received and your support is very much appreciated. Until next time, toodle pip. <laughs>